Good afternoon, uh, uh, Professor Good afternoon. Thomas Pogge, and thank you very much for sparing your time. Absolutely, being with us. yeah. Uh, the first uh, question I wanted to ask you was uh, in your uh, lecture the other day, you mentioned about the elites in the US uh, controlling globalization process uh, in their own vested interests. Now, would you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, it's basically a two step process. You have, on the one hand, a political system that is very much up for sale. So as you know, elections in the United States are privately funded. The parties and the candidates get enormous amounts of money from private interests, from corporations, from hedge funds, from billionaires. And in addition, there are these PACs and super PACs that collect money to run advertisements for particular issues or for particular candidates. And this election is estimated to cost around $7 billion dollars an enormous amount of money and of course politicians who are given that money are beholden to those who give the money. That's step one. Step two is that everybody understands that the rules of our international system have important distributive implications. Depending on how trade, uh, business, finance and various other rules of our international order are shaped, some parties will benefit, other parties will lose. And so, of course, these very powerful agents, multinational corporations, banks, hedge funds, and so on, have a vested interest in shaping these global rules in their own favor. Often they compete with each other, but in the end, they, uh, with their money, buy themselves the support of the US government, and they get more or less what they want. Not everybody gets exactly what they want, but by and large, they get what is good for corporate America at the expense of the rest of the US population, the great majority, and most importantly, at the expense of the population in the poorer developing countries. So what you see in the last 25 years or so of globalization since the end of the Cold War is a great enrichment of the top 1% of the global population and in particular, the richest Americans, because they have the American government in their corner. They are in a position to buy themselves support from the US government, which is all important because the US are still the strongest power in these international negotiations. You also spoke about uh, the MNCs not paying any taxes uh, in their uh, home countries and also, uh, uh, you know, uh, transferring whatever they can manage and manipulating their earnings from the South. Yeah, uh, that is a very big problem for especially the poorer Southern countries that the multinationals that are operating in these countries essentially pay no taxes there. And they avoid paying taxes through transactions between affiliated subsidiaries of the same company. So a big multinational will have subsidiaries in maybe a hundred different countries and much of global trade these days is trade within the same conglomerate. So you have one subsidiary trading with another and the prices at which they exchange are of course prices that don't really matter because both subsidiaries belong to the same conglomerate. But they do matter in that if one side gets an unfavorable price and the other gets a favorable price, then the first will have less profit and the other will have more profit. And so companies can use that trick to shift profit from countries in which the tax on profits is high into countries where the tax on profit is low or non-existent. And this is where tax havens come in. Tax havens are countries where taxes are basically non-existent and so multinational corporations and banks and so on are shifting their profits from ordinary developing countries into tax havens and thereby save the trouble of paying taxes altogether. In the rich countries, they have to pay a little bit of taxes because these countries are politically too strong. But in the southern countries, often they pay no taxes at all. They simply dissipate their entire profit through unfavorable trading with other subsidiaries and tax havens. Uh, you also talk about uh, the massive uh, human rights deficit. And, uh, uh, you know, you say that uh, uh, there's a violation of the human rights of the poor. 
Now, would you uh, elaborate that? Yeah. The basic idea is that, of course, we have enormous human rights deficits still. So important human rights are unfulfilled for most people in the poorer half of the human population. For example, the right uh, to a sufficient income that is sufficient to feed one's family, to take care of basic health care and education and so on. So these big rights deficits are often perceived in the West as an occasion for helping. Maybe we should help these guys. What we in the West often don't realize is that we are causing these deficits through an unjust world order, which I talked about earlier, that allows us to benefit at the expense of the poor. So we import cheap resources from poor countries in ways that don't benefit the population of those countries. We impose externalities through our CO2 emissions, which cause uh, global warming and high vulnerabilities in poor countries and so on. So we actively contribute to these human rights deficits and we are therefore violating, actively violating the human rights of the world's poor, or so I've argued in many of my writings. You've also talked about uh, the great, two greatest challenges facing humanity. One is environmental degradation and the other is persistence of poverty. And then you talk of the global uh, resources dividend. Now, uh, uh, how do you think this is going to change the entire uh, uh, paradigm of discussion on poverty reduction? Yeah, so uh, the global resources dividend is trying to solve two very big problems at once. And the two that you mentioned, namely the ecological problem and the poverty problem. And that's really nice if you can, with one mechanism, you can tackle these two issues. The way it works is that we say that all the resources belong to the people on whose territory they are, but not completely. So the people of the territory have to give a small percentage of the value of any resources they choose to extract into a pool for the common benefit, and in particular a pool that fights poverty. What I hope is that this pool will collect about $300 billion every year and that that money will then be used for effective poverty eradication. That would, on the income side, discourage uh, pollution emissions and thereby help with global warming because it would make resource consumption more expensive. And on the expenditure side, it would create a large revenue stream that would be used continuously for poverty eradication and $300 billion a year would be enough to eradicate at least that severe poverty that we associate with unfulfilled human rights. Okay, now uh, if we could, uh, uh, you know, uh, you have uh, extended uh, uh, John Rawls' theory of justice and then uh, you talk of the PDPT the purely domestic causation of poverty. Yeah. Can you explain that? Yeah. So as I said earlier, many people who think about poverty in the developing world, they think that it is due exclusively to local factors. Local factors such as bad institutions, being landlocked, bad climate, lack of resources, a bad religion, and so on. These are the things that people mention. And what it impresses people, especially economists, is the great diversity in developmental trajectories. So what economists are saying is, look at China and Nigeria. Look at Ghana and South Korea. They were all poor in the 1950s. And look, the one has developed very well, the other has developed very poorly. So obviously, it's local factors that are all important. Now, I'm not denying that local factors are important, but I'm denying that global factors are not also important. So I'm saying it's like a teacher in a classroom. Sometimes at the end of a semester, some students have learned a lot, other students have very little, have learned very little. And so, of course, there must be local factors specific to each student that explain why some students did do well, other students did do poorly.
But that doesn't mean that the teacher is irrelevant to student success. The teacher is also relevant. The teacher, in using certain materials and certain teaching styles, is helping some students learn especially well, other students maybe not so well. So the teacher is a very important factor. And similarly, the global institutional architecture is very important for explaining which countries do well and which countries do poorly. For example, the neoliberal paradigm that was built at the end of the Cold War has been very favorable to China's development, but has been disastrous for the development in many of the resource-rich countries of Africa. So what I'm saying is that it's wrong to think that local factors explain everything. We have to explain the poverty trajectories in different parts of the world through a combination of global and local factors. And of course, for the global factors, the rich countries and their neoliberal globalization project bear a very heavy responsibility. Okay. And then you have offered a critique uh, of the sustainable development goals. Now, would you, how would you, uh, I mean, briefly? Yes. So there are actually several points of critique. One very important critique point is that when you speak the language of goals, you're always putting people in mind of progressing slowly in the right direction. But what is at stake here are human rights. And human rights don't allow you to do a little bit each day to sort of fulfill them at a leisurely pace. Human rights mean that we have to act right now as quickly as we possibly can. So any talk about goals is really obscuring the stringency and immediacy of our obligation. Another thing that I've criticized is the measurement. The measurement is always entrusted to intergovernmental agencies such as the World Bank and the FAO. And these agencies are politically vulnerable, they're exposed, and they cannot really report objectively on their own success. So what we need is, if we want to know what is happening with regard to poverty, hunger, disease, and so on, we have to have independent measurement. And that has to be done by objective academics who are peer-reviewed. The best academics have to form a network. And with that network, we have to provide objective measurements to the world. The MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, which were the predecessors of the SDGs, show very clearly that the measurement of these official agencies has been bogus measurement and we really don't know how many people are undernourished, how many people cannot meet their basic needs and so forth. And to get that information we need objective academic measurement. You've been an academic uh, activist and you uh, were the pioneer in starting this uh, the academic stand against poverty. Now, how is this uh, created? Well, uh, it was uh, the idea of several academics and they said that we have already a wonderful network around the globe of academic institutions that are communicating with each other. A whole infrastructure of people who communicate across disciplines, across universities, across national borders. And we can use this world-spanning network of academics to bring poverty-focused academics together and make them much more effective than they are if they operate individually. So that was our objective. We want to say that poverty-focused academics should not only know what is happening, but they should change what is happening. They should give policymakers and NGOs the tools to do things better to reform institutions, to reform policies, and so on. And the best way they can do that is if they can connect with each other, share experiences, share their research, and speak with one voice, learn from one another, and speak with one voice. So we want to make academics effective in the fight against poverty, and thereby, of course, achieve our ultimate purpose, which is to eradicate poverty as quickly as we possibly can. Now, uh, under this uh, ASAP, that's an interesting acronym, you have, uh, 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 you're focusing on health, and that's especially relevant to India. Now, how is this to come about? 
Yeah, so our health focus deals with uh, pharmaceutical innovation. So in order to fight diseases such as malaria, tuberculosis, schistosomiasis and so on, we need new medicines. These diseases are very common among the poor, they do a lot of damage, but nevertheless pharmaceutical companies don't like to research these diseases. Why not? Because the people who have the diseases are poor and they cannot pay high prices for medicines. And this is the business model of pharmaceutical innovators. They develop a new medicine, they get a patent, and during the time that the patent lasts, they sell the medicine at a very high price, and they make a lot of profit, which reimburses them for the research and development cost. But this model doesn't produce solutions for the poor, because the poor cannot pay these high prices, and so the companies don't develop medicines for the poor. So what we want to do is we want to develop a new model for paying pharmaceutical research. The new model says we will give you rewards that are proportional to the health impact of your medicine if you agree to sell the medicine at cost. So you give away your monopoly power and we give you a reward. The reward would be paid every year out of pools of money that are collected from governments. So taxpayers from many different countries would fund the rewards and they would also profit from the cheaper medicine prices for all the medicines that are registered with the fund. Each pharmaceutical company has a choice. They can stay with the old system, get a monopoly, a patent, and then sell at a high price or they can develop other medicines and register them with the Health Impact Fund, sell at cost, but get rewards out of the pools. So I think pharmaceutical companies would do both. They would develop some drugs for rich people, the traditional way with the patent, and some other drugs for poor people in the new way, getting reward monies out of the pool. And that is the idea. We have a two-track system where poor people can also benefit from all this wonderful research and development capacity that now exists in the world. Have you met in some success in this already? Well, we are uh, successful in several senses. We have government support from some governments. We are currently talking with the Indian government to support us. Germany is supporting us. We also have pharmaceutical company support, which is very important because governments will be shy to support something like that if the pharma companies hate it. So the biggest pharma company in the world, called Johnson & Johnson, is supporting our project and we are together running a pilot in Mumbai now, a measurement pilot at Hinduja Hospital with a new tuberculosis drug called Bedaquilin. That's a Johnson & Johnson drug, and Johnson & Johnson is supporting that pilot. So we're very happy and proud that we have that support, and we now presented the proposal to the new high-level panel on access to medicines, which is a UN panel, which is examining solutions to the global health crisis. Uh, we have presented our solution, and we hope that we will get support from that high-level panel. And with that support, we hope we can then also get support from countries and support from foundations like the Gates Foundation, for example, for another large pilot where we would try out the idea to prove to the world that pharmaceutical companies will respond to these financial incentives and will develop some of the medicines that the world urgently needs, the poor world urgently needs. Uh, experience the world over has confirmed that while growth is important, social welfare and elimination of poverty is almost and everywhere a function of policy, not of growth. Now, how does your experience support this idea? Yeah, I think it is a, a pretty simple point. Uh, when you look at growth, growth tells you how much a pie has increased, but it doesn't tell you anything about the distribution. So if, for example, take India as an example, if India's GNP, gross national product, doubles, 
it is possible that all the increase goes to the top 10% of the Indian population and the other 90% are as badly off as before. In fact, they are worse off in a way because the inequality has increased and they are more dominated by the rich. So growth alone is not necessarily a solution. It can be a good thing if the poor participate, but all too often in recent years the poor have not participated. So in China, for example, we had very, very good growth for 25 years, but inequality has increased enormously. The poor have grown a little bit and the rich have grown a lot. And so now you have enormous dominance and civility in China, similar to what existed before liberation, before the communist revolution in China. So that's why policy is all important, because policy determines how this growth is distributed, how unequal the shares are. You can, in a country like India, or certainly in the world, you can help the poor much faster and much better simply through changing the distribution of income and wealth, rather than by waiting for growth to lift all boats. How do we change the inequality? Well, we have many different rules which are designed now, both at the national level and at the global level, for the benefit of the rich. The rich are much better able than poor people to influence rule-making processes, to influence the parliament, to influence the politicians, the parties, and they do that, of course, in their own interest. The rich also have much more expertise. They understand what rules are good for them, what rules are bad for them, whereas the vast majority of the population has no idea. So, for example, when India is negotiating now some free trade agreement with other countries, the government is the negotiator, they send a delegation to the negotiations, and the richest corporations in India, they are very interested, they want certain outcomes. So they go to the government, they say, please, we want this, we want this, we want this, and we are willing to support you and give you other things that you want if you support us and get us at these international negotiations what you want. Now, 99.9% .9 of the Indian population has no idea what goes on in Geneva or in New York in these negotiations, and they don't know how an outcome will affect them. But it will affect them, but they cannot lobby because they don't know. And so, by default, a very small minority of people who can influence politicians and who can have the expertise, those people determine the outcome of these negotiations amongst themselves. And so it's not surprising that the rule of our international system and also often the rules on the national level are so favorable to the rich and that means that growth will bring more advantage to the rich and very little advantage to the poor. Fantastically explained. Now, uh, you know, we began with uh, that, uh, what you mentioned at the lecture, the elites in the US have controlled globalization to suit their interests. Uh, I mean, in India also, the elite has controlled national policies to suit themselves. You know? Now, how do we get out, get out of this catch-22? Yeah, the way to get out of this catch-22 is we have to make citizens, empower citizens to speak and first understand the issues and then speak with one voice, speak collectively, understand what's going on. So we need education. So long as poor people do not really understand the impact that rules national rules, international rules have on themselves, they will not be able to vote in the right way, right? They will be seduced by some populist like Donald Trump, for example, and they will not really be able to fend for their own interests. So we need that education, and that education has to be provided to some extent by NGOs, for example, by organizations, mass movements that can teach people and say, look, this is important. You have to understand that by supporting this rule or by supporting this party, you are harming your own interests. This is maybe a good looking person. Maybe he 
sounds good on the television, but he is not safeguarding your interests. So this is the, the step forward. And of course in India, uh, one big problem that you have is the education system. The education system is weak, you know, even though most people now go to school, they go to very poor schools. Uh, the teachers don't show up very often. The teaching is often very rudimentary. And so people, even after five, six, seven years of schooling, are essentially still very, very poorly educated. So I think that is important to change. And it is also important to build a mobilization with NGOs, with uh, grassroots organizations who are reliable and whom the people can trust. So it's a very difficult task to do that, but I think it is possible to achieve that. And uh, some of the movements of recent years, the Anasari movement about uh, trying to fight corruption and so on, have given some example of how that is possible. Your title of the book which you wrote some years back was uh, Politics as Usual. What lies behind the pro-poor rhetoric? Now, if you put it briefly, what really lies behind the pro-poor rhetoric? Yeah, so the word lies, of course, is ambiguous between lying down and lying as in not speaking the truth. And so there is a lot of lying going on, and the book talks about that. All the manipulations of numbers, all the fake statistics, all the professions of we are trying our best, and unfortunately we had bad luck, and once again we failed, but you know we are trying so hard, and so on. So uh, I take apart all these lies and try to show what the true interests are that motivate the description of the poverty problem and the human rights deficits, the explanations that are often given, the moral assessments that we are treated to in the media, and also the reforms, if there are reforms, that the official politicians are proposing. And I'm saying basically you have to cut through this ideological spider web of fake explanations in order to see how the world is really working and then to think what would really be an adequate reform of the existing system. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. And uh, thank you for, uh, you know, uh, uh, try more, uh, I would say, more power to your elbow to bring about uh, greater awareness uh, among the people uh, to fight for uh, emancipation and fight against poverty. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the conversation.